much. Thank you. At six minutes to nine, Professor Ibram X. Kennedy's... Kennedy's? That's a Freudian slip if ever there was one. Kennedy's book, uh, maybe a rude one, sorry, Ibram. Uh, his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, has proved influential. Discussed, disputed, debated and read by millions of Americans, the case it made was complex, arguing for a complete reappraisal of the role of race in American history. His new book, How to Raise an Anti-Racist, examines how we should talk to our children about our, about race. And now that I've insulted him with his... <laughs> getting his name wrong, I'm so sorry. He's here in the studio, Professor Ibrahim X. Kennedy. Welcome and, and thank you very much, Dee, for coming in. How are you? I'm OK. Thank you. Kennedy, not Kennedy. Um, I do want to focus on this book uh, that you've written, How to Raise an Anti-Racist and how you speak about uh, race to kids rather than relitigate all the arguments of your last book, which I know you spent many years talking about just because this is the new thing. Why have you decided to, to change your focus to children? I think the biggest reason is the realisation that the very people who are the most vulnerable to the dangers of an unequal society, to the dangers of uh, messages that certain people are better or worse because of their skin color, are the very people we're the least likely to engage and to talk about uh, those topics, and that is children. And when's a good age to start talking to them about it, do you think? And talk to them not just about race, but about the history of racism. Well, it's actually never too early to start. And so, like, to, six, to, six months would be a bit early, wouldn't it? Well, if we think about a quality like a behavior like kindness, you know, we never think it's too early to, to start raising a child to be kind. Similarly, to raise a child to view all these different peoples as equals and, and to see the problem as bad rules as opposed to, to bad people, it's, it's never too early. And indeed, when we when it's young children they're actually more influenced by the environment that we're putting them in, our nonverbal language. And so that's why it's very important, even when they're very young. And in terms of the practical messages we should be conveying, which I know the book gets into, um, you know, my son, who's uh, six and a, and a bit, uh, he's got beautiful golden brown skin. He's mixed ethnicity. His mum is white English. If he worries about being different to other people, most other people, you know, he's got a very uh, culturally diverse school. What do you think the message should be to him? Well, I think, the message to be to him should be there's there's nothing wrong with you because of the color of your skin or because of your background. Uh, just like I think the message to to a white child should be you're special when you share or when you're nice, but you're not special because of your skin color. Do you think that is a message that white children hear though? Oh, without question. I mean, if for instance, if in a school uh, you don't talk about racism and the environment is, is inequality, it's racial disparity, then you're essentially teaching a child, let's say, that white people have more because they are more. And then if they're not, if you don't have a diverse curriculum, then literally white people are more in the curriculum. So you're teaching them that in two different ways. And so I think it's important to, to teach both white children and even children of color uh, that there's nothing wrong or right about them because of their skin colour. Let me put to you the argument of uh, the British minister, Kemi Badnock, whose parents have uh, African heritage. She says the phrase white privilege reinforces the notion that everyone and everything around ethnic minorities is racist and it makes the majority white population of the UK, she was talking about, more conscious about their race, creating a less cohesive society. Well, the, the question actually is, are there racial disparities? Are there racial inequities? Isn't the question, how do you address them? I mean, most people accept that they exist, and that's a matter of sort of fact. Well, well some people don't, right? right? And so then the question becomes, why do they exist? Do they exist because certain groups are inferior, or do they exist because of racism? And so I would say they exist because of racism, so we should talk about it. And is there a danger? I mean, one of the broader critiques, which I know you've, you've addressed in this book and others, is that a the story that you've told in this book and, and also in How to Be an Anti-Racist tells too reductive a story about history and it makes people fatalistic about the possibility of progress. What would you say to that? I would say that in the whole construct of being anti-racist isn't a fatalistic construct. It's, it's one that allows people to understand that they have the ability to transform their society, to transform their world, and they look into history to the people who challenged slavery, who challenged colonialism, who created equality over the course of history. And what about the, the other argument that you have to reckon with all the time? I don't know how much this is the case in America, but you often hear it here, where people say, we talk about 
that stuff all the time. There's Black History Month. We talk about colonialism. Actually, kids in this country don't get an entirely white syllabus. They don't get an entirely white curriculum. Actually, they get a pretty diverse one. And one that's gotten more diverse in recent years, perhaps because of people reading books like yours. I'd say, why can't we do better? <laughs> why can't we do more? Um, and and I think we, in many ways, we've only started uh, whether in the United States or even here in, 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 in the UK, to really think very deeply about the messages that young children, even older children, are receiving. To give an example, one of the major problems facing particularly white children across the Western world is that online they're being recruited by white supremacists. And so how are we? How, how would they be able to understand that ideology if we're, we're not reading your Reading different. your book might help. Professor Ibrahim X. Kennedy, we've got to leave it there. Sorry for... Cutting you off. That's it from Hamill and me. Good morning.